Hi, and welcome to another episode of Piano TV. So today I wanted to get into a little bit of history and sounds and orchestra, because I think orchestras are really, really fascinating, but a lot of the time when we go to see like a symphony or like other type of orchestral performance, it can be kind of overwhelming if we, if we don't know what we're paying attention to. So what I wanna do in this two-part video is in today's video, I wanna go through all of the different instruments you'll encounter in a modern orchestra, talk about how the orchestra the floor plan is usually set up and how all the different instruments are, are configured and what the function of each group is. In the next video on orchestras, what I wanna talk about is more of the history, so how the orchestra originated and how it evolved over the years and talk about specific composers and symphonies that kinda of like changed the course of history. This can kind of be thought of as like my my version of the young person's guide to the orchestra. And if you don't know what that is, that probably just means you haven't had to uh, take like a music history class or a music instrument listening class, which they usually make you do um, in university or if you're doing RCM exams or the like. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should check it out on YouTube. It's a really good, it's like 16 or 17 minutes, I think, and it's basically like one composition, but it's like a tour of all the different instruments. But we'll we'll do more of that in my version of this video, which is going to be like a lot lower key, but hopefully still helpful. So let's talk about the basic modern orchestra, which is usually used for classical music performances. We have four different categories of instruments. We have strings, which are things like the violin and cello and viola. You got things like the woodwinds, which are all kind of nicely labeled here. I don't know why the other ones aren't labeled. And then you have your brass instruments like trumpets and then your percussion family, which is very, very large. And there's lots of different options. And then you also have the random guest appearance instruments that join the mix sometimes like pianos and harps but these four categories are the main standards. So this here is the typical arrangement of instruments you see if you went to an orchestra performance. There is usually gonna be between 70 and 100 players, and you'll notice about two thirds of that are actually gonna be string instruments. So they make up the largest bulk of the orchestra. So string instruments are over here, violin, second violin, basically just like the same instrument but split into two parts. Then you have viola, cello, and all this double bass. Then over here in the middle, you've got about a dozen woodwind players and the smallest woodwinds, like the flute, are basically placed like right over here on the piccolo too, are placed front and center. This is because flutes aren't very loud. So if you put them close to the front and center, it helps the sound reach the listener's ears. And that's the exact same reason why the 10 or so horn instruments are like the brass are in the back because most of us know they are super, super loud. And same goes for percussion overall when we're talking talking about, you know, bass drums and stuff. And percussion almost never plays like a central melodic role. So they're hanging out in the back. So first of all, I want to talk about the string section. We're going to go into the individual sounds of these instruments in a bit, but let's just quickly look at what exact instruments we're going to be listening to. So I'm going to go in order from highest pitch to lowest pitch. So starting with the highest string instrument, we have the violins. So the first and second violins are the different groups. Now it's the same instruments, but the first violins generally will play a higher part and the second violins will play a lower part. And they're super abundant in an orchestra you're gonna get about like 30 violins in your regular orchestra. And then we've got the violas, which are, I just have a comparison picture here. So the viola one is the bottom. So they're a little bit larger and lower pitched than a violin. And there's usually about a dozen of these in an orchestra. The cello is actually traditionally called the violoncello. I might actually be pronouncing that wrong. Um, but nowadays we just call it the cello. These are pretty large. That's why I put like a person in there so you can kind of see the human to instrument comparison size. And they have a fairly pleasant low bassy sound and they'll have around 10 of these in an orchestra. And for the largest and lowest of instruments in the string family, we have the double bass, which people will play standing because it's such a huge instrument. And this will create like that, that really, really low. The double bass will almost never take the melody because it's just such a low pitch, but it's a very good supporting instrument. And there's about eight of these in an orchestra. So that totals to about 60 string instruments in your standard modern orchestra. So so now let's just go through and take a listen to what they sound like.
like we did with the string section, we're going to start from the highest pitched woodwind and work our way down to the lowest ones. Now, woodwinds are called as such because you blow into them, which is the wind part, and they used to be made of wood. But of course, wooden flutes aren't a thing in orchestras anymore, but some instruments like clarinets and oboes still use wooden reeds. So anyway, a little, little bit of origin story there. So starting from the highest, we have the piccolo, which is a extremely small and very high pitched. It can be like even very shrill. And there's usually just one of these in the orchestra because they're pretty intense. The flute usually has two to three in an orchestra and they have kind of like a high and light and airy sound, but it's not nearly as shrill as the piccolo. There are usually two to four oboes in an orchestra and that usually includes one English horn. And the English horn is a little bit bigger and mellower and lower, lower pitch than the oboe. And you can kind of guess that just because usually when an instrument's bigger, it's going to sound lower. The oboe can be compared to an alto voice. It's kind of like a mid-range pitch. It's not super high, but there's some something in the tone of the instrument that always just kind of has this like mellow and sometimes even sad sound. Then we have the clarinets and the bass clarinet. So there are two to four clarinets in the orchestra and then that includes one bass clarinet. And clarinets are super versatile. They have a huge range of notes and they have like a, a, a again, kind of a mid-range pitch. They're gonna be in like that alto range, but they can really go all over the place. The bass clarinet, again, it's a bigger instrument, so it's gonna be a lower pitch and it's just got like a slightly mellower sound. And then we got our lowest brass instruments in the orchestra. So we have the bassoon, which is a very dark sounding instrument and it almost always plays like pretty low parts. Although it's kind of like the clarinet in that it has a fairly wide range. Now the bassoon can be compared to the male baritone voice. And there's going to be two to four of these in the orchestra. And then we got the contrabassoon, which if you can see in this picture, I just wanted the size comparison. They're pretty gigantic and there's going to be one to two of these in the orchestra and they play the same part as a bassoon but an octave lower so it sounds very very low So next up we have the brass family and the first group we're going to talk about are horns and this is just kind of a catch-all term for German horns and French horns and Vienna horns and so on. Those would be the most commonly seen in an orchestra. They're, they're pretty similar but there are some differences between it like for example the German horn which I would say is the most common. Uh, it has like a warmer and richer tone than say the French horn which is a little bit lighter and more open sounding and there's going to be about four to eight of these in an orchestra. Then we've got the trumpet and everyone knows the trumpet. There's going to be three to six of these in an orchestra. They're super loud. They're oftentimes used for like to create like a military like effect or to just like add volume and drama to whatever else the orchestra is doing. Trombones are lower and mellower sounding than trumpets and there's going to be about three to six of these in the orchestra. These have kind of a neat neat sound. So while the trumpet has valves that you press that create distinct tones or kind of like if you if you picture a keyboard each one of the keys creates its own tone. The trombone is fun and interesting because it has a slide so you can kind of create like a uh, instead of like the choppiness that keys have you can create like a very uh, swoopy flexible sound with that slide. And then on the low end we've got the tuba and again I wanted to just like human for scale these are very very large instruments and they're also quite loud so there's going to be one to two of these in the orchestra and like the other lowest bass instruments this is not usually going to take the starring role. The tuba is more of just like a supporting to like kind of fill out the low sounds, but it, it's almost never spotlighted. You'll notice that all instrument families, like whether we're talking about strings or woodwinds or brass, you'll 
see instruments that fill in the highs, mids, and lows in each category. So on the high end, for example, you have violins, flutes, and trumpets. And on the low end, you have double basses, bassoons, contra bassoons, and tuba. So just kind of a little fun fact. Percussion in an orchestra is a really large category. There's tons of options, but it's generally used really, really sparingly. Kind of like the, not even the icing on the cake, kind of like the swirly letters on the icing on the cake. But percussion can have a huge impact for how infrequent it's used. So I'd say some of the most common would be the timpani, the bass drum, and the snare drum. So the timpani and bass drum are really, really large and common. And these are what's going to add deep booming rolls and hits to a performance. Whereas the snare drum has like a higher pitched and more bracing sounds and is often used for like a military march type effect. Then we've got our cymbals, tam tam and gong and tam tam and gongs are different, but for our purposes today, they're basically just the same thing. So the gong, you probably can imagine that sound in your head. It's a very, very loud crashing sound, but it's a little bit low pitched, whereas the cymbals have a higher pitched sound um, and they're still very loud. They're used for climactic moments in an orchestra performance. A lot of the times they'll be used simultaneously with bass drum hits as well, just to create like a really satisfying crash. The triangle and the wood block are a lot quieter. They basically just add some background rhythm and they're not like super, super common in orchestras, though you will see them. And triangles are a little bit more common than wood blocks. Then we've got our pitched mallet instruments. So these would be the xylophone, the glockenspiel, and the vibraphone. So what I mean when I say they're pitched is they create a tone. So most drums just kind of create like a thud or a crash, but these will actually kind of like a keyboard and they look like keyboards too. Um, each of the different blocks have a different tone, just, just like keys on a piano. And these are pretty common in orchestral performances. And there's many, many more percussion instruments, but these are generally the main ones. And I just think this is beyond the scope of the video today to get into like all the very random obscure percussion instruments. Anyway, let's take a listen to them. So now you have heard all of the individual little sound clips kind of patched together one at a time. But what about when they are interwoven in the context of a full orchestration, like a, like a symphony or an opera or ballet or whatever you're listening to? This is beyond the scope of the video, but stick with me here for a second. So what I've provided on the blog, which is linked to in the description bar below, is a video of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. Now, the first movement of the symphony is about 17 minutes long, but it's really, really awesome. But aside from that, I made a little PDF to go along with it, kind of like a listening guide. So it's nothing really in depth. It's basically just pointing out different times in the video that certain things are happening. Like maybe at one minute and 32 seconds, there's like a flute solo or something. I just make note of that. And I did that because sometimes when you're learning how to listen to symphony performances, it's sometimes hard to pick out what the different parts are when you're just starting. So it was kind of just intended as something like, while you're watching and listening, you can kind of look and 
kind of cross reference, oh, okay, now it's five minutes, 30 seconds, this thing's happening. The video I'm gonna share on my blog is also, it's a really, really awesome video of their performance. It's a live performance. And the videographer does like close-ups of the different instruments who are playing. So it's easier to, to keep track of it. But for obvious copyright reasons, I can't put the video on my channel. I can't like republish a video. So that's why I'll just be linking to it instead. Anyway, that is all for today's video. I hope you enjoyed part one of the beginner's guide to orchestration, which is I think what I called this video, something along those lines anyway. So stay tuned for part two, where we get into a little bit more of the history, which is always, I don't know, that's like, that's where my heart's at. I'm always into the history and I hope you are too. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time. Why did it stop working? Oh, that's why I'm not using the right tablet. Oh my goodness. This is why I don't record first thing in the morning.